Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Hello to the friends of globeethics.net, to our students, to our colleagues, supporters around the world. We are very pleased to welcome you to our second Blue Table webinar uh, dedicated to the topic of ethics and diversity. Those of you who have attended um, our first uh, webinar are already more familiar with the title we have given these, this series, a Blue Table Webinar, Blue Table, because we want to bring together um, experts from around the world uh, to a conversation uh, table uh, around cutting edge uh, topics that preoccupy us um, in our contemporary world and blue because it's the color of globeethics.net. As you may know, we offer uh, an online academic course program and these webinars are embedded in our academic uh, program. The webinars are meant to enrich the academic life of our students, but we open it also to a broader audience. So you may wish to join us um, also in the subsequent uh, webinars we are offering. And at the end of this session, we will have the pleasure to indicate to you what is coming up next. But today we are very pleased that uh, Professor Diki Sofian from Indonesia and Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith uh, from the United States are joining us as our distinguished speakers. The two um, have their own lenses and perspectives on the topic of ethics and diversity. We have invited them to speak uh, to this topic from their respective contextual locations and from the perspective of their um, engagement. Both have in their personal and professional lives um, a broad um, exposure to um, diversity as a theme in general, not only as um, an area where they have conducted uh, research. Uh, Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith is um, a, a theologian and uh, Dr. Diki Sofian uh, is a professor teaching religious studies and um, also neighboring uh, disciplines, particularly he is engaged in uh, development. Um, but a little bit further, um, I would like um, to offer um, more uh, on their backgrounds. Permit me to say just three uh, brief interrogations that motivated us to select this topic, ethics and diversity. Kofi Annan once said, we may have different religions, different languages, different colored skin, but we all belong to one human race. The time could not be more propitious to state that diversity is at the heart um, of our preoccupation as we live in a world with a rising uh, tension, sometimes harsh antagonism, uh, conflicts and even violence. So the first interrogation we bring to the table today is how can people live together in complex situations? You may think of your own societies, communities, or the interstate relations. So what are these values um, at the global level, but also at the regional level uh, that help us to deal with uh, differences in a constructive manner? And secondly, we may think of how the differences inform us or can serve as an inspiration for continuous learning rather than of exclusion. This is certainly something that the educators among us would bring to the fore. And thirdly, what are the modules uh, that we can learn from uh, in addressing tensions that arise around diversity. 
The philosopher Richard Precht uh, once said that in our contemporary world, it's not so much about what we should do, so not so much the exhortation that counts, but more so how people can adopt postures and attitudes um, in a, a kind of positive imitation and multiplication um, of successful models of living together in diversity. Maybe our speakers today will, from their own perspectives, address one or the other questions. Permit me to say that um, I am very pleased and it is our privilege to welcome once again Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith and Professor Dr. Diki Sofian. Uh, first, I would call upon uh, Diki Sofian, who will uh, speak uh, to us as the core doctoral faculty member of the Indonesian Consortium uh, for Religious Studies of the Graduate School of the Universitas Gadja Mada in Yogyakarta in Indonesia. He is our member of the global pool of experts um, and he has um, held various leading uh, management positions uh, prior to his uh, teaching uh, position for several international organizations. He has a wide international uh, exposure, has lived in many countries of the world, and for him, listening, observing, and learning other people and from other people, societies and their ways of living their lives um, informs his academic and personal life. I had the pleasure to collaborate closely with Professor Sofian in the development of our current course on interreligious cooperation for peace. And uh, this is uh, also something that I would invite our external uh, participants um, today to visit our website and to see uh, what course offers we have and to follow us closely. We would be very uh, pleased to see us, to see you as our future uh, course participants. Without further ado, uh, I would pass on to Professor Diki Sofian with uh, thanks again for his time. The floor is yours, Diki. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you all. Hello, good evening, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. So thank you very much for the fine introduction, uh, Professor Amile Ukwe. Uh, I'd like to take this first opportunity to thank the um, organizers for inviting me to this fabulous event and prestigious event, uh, namely Professor Amile and Lydia Stotskopsi uh, from the Globe Ethics Academic Affairs Division. I'm proud to say that I've been collaborating with Globe Ethics for uh, quite some time now, and I, I would like to continue to collaborate in the many more years to come, inshallah. So my name is Dikis Softian from the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies. So it's a consortium of three universities comprising Gajamadi University, the non-confessional university, the Christian university, and the um, uh, Islamic university of Sunan Kalijogo, all based in Yogyakarta. And so I've been tasked to sort of uh, share my uh, thoughts and insights on religious and ethnic diversity and how we uh, in higher education in Indonesia can play a role in that. Uh, and I believe that coming from a multicultural and multi-religious uh, country like Indonesia, this theme definitely uh, suits me perfectly. But I would also like to mention that given the contemporary context in the world we live, in right now that this topic is obviously of great relevance to many countries of the world yeah so so i would like to structure my presentation in in just sort of giving an overview in terms of indonesia's uh, mega diversity yeah uh, because as you all probably know that indonesia is a huge country with three time zones uh, located in Southeast Asia. Um, 
the second part, I will talk more about the sort of political uh, context in which uh, we are currently living in after more than 20 years of uh, reform, uh, which occurred in 97-98, which dethroned uh, the new order regime. And then I will proceed to talk about how agama or religion and the management of diversity uh, is, is being held up in the country by uh, the state and society. And then I'll talk a little bit and touch upon uh, how Indonesian Islam plays a role in sort of moderating uh, the uh, dynamics uh, among the religious communities throughout Indonesia. I would also like here to invite uh, this new concept, relatively new concept, and, and that is knowledge brokering. How we uh, as academics and intellectuals could actually help in mediating uh, some of the discourses and the various uh, forms and systems of knowledge, available knowledge out there to help bring uh, you know, the society to uh, a better um, condition. And then lastly, I will uh, talk about the ethical considerations and implications of how religious diversity is being managed in Indonesia and how intellectuals, academics, and those engaging in higher education could uh, take up a proactive role in it. So first of all, I just like to say that Indonesia comprises 17,000 islands yeah, with wide range of floral and faunal uh, species. Uh, and this was um, very much highlighted by a very classic book by Alfred Russell Wallace uh, in the 19th century uh, called the Malay Archipelago, which he talks vividly about the orangutans, the birds of paradise, and all kinds of uh, species uh, in various parts of Indonesia, especially in the island of Sulawesi, where his name then was uh, attributed uh, to that. But then we also have a rich uh, seascapes and marine life. And what this translates into is that um, my argument is to say that the, the social cultural diversity and the religious diversity in Indonesia also mirrors that uh, diversity that we see in the ecological settings of the archipelago. We have around 700 psycholinguistic groups. Yeah, so around 500 languages and 700 uh, dialects across uh, the country. We have different food and culinary art forms in, in various provinces and districts. We have uh, over 500 districts uh, in uh, Indonesia and, and uh, 34 provinces. We have different ethnic dresses, traditional costumes. We have various uh, kinds of batik fabrics. I'm wearing uh, one specific um, batik uh, fabric right now. And then of course, uh, like all uh, and many Southeast Asian nations, we are also into you know, songs and dances, which you could uh, view uh, for each of the uh, provinces and regions of the country. Now, uh, religiously speaking, in terms of demographics, um, Islam is the predominant uh, religion. And when I say Islam here, it is Sunni Islam. Uh, with the predominance of the Shafi'i juridical uh, school. So within the Sunni Islam, uh, you have four major imams uh, who had uh, what we call mazhabs or juridical schools. Yeah? Um, but then apart from Islam, we also have um, other religions, notably world religions. Um, of course, we have Catholicism, we have Protestantism, we have Hinduism, Buddhism, and in Indonesia, Confucianism is, uh, is under the category of religion. So essentially, these are the six mainstream uh, world religions that are um, sort of recognized and uh, serviced by the state, namely by the Ministry of Religious Affairs, which I will talk more about later on. But then apart from these world religions, there are also um, other 
world religions, so to speak. So you have sheikhs, you have Baha'is, you have Shintos and, and others. But in addition to all of those religions, you also have uh, around 400, possibly around 400 so-called local religions or indigenous spiritual beliefs uh, spread across the archipelago. You know, having the different uh, worldviews, rituals, uh, festivities, and so on and so forth. Um, this is the um, sort of a, a picture of that tells you how religion is important in Indonesia. So, if you look at the uh, uh, the chart, this is the national budget allocation for ministries and state agencies. Uh, in Indonesia. As you can see, the Ministry of Religious Affairs uh, comes forth with the budget of uh, 65.1 trillion. And so that's uh, around 4.5 billion US dollars per year. So you can just imagine the, uh, the, you know, the power of this ministry and the extent to which uh, they can reach the country because they have uh, branches and sub branches in uh, virtually all of the districts and sub districts of uh, Indonesia. Now, in looking at diversity, um, religion comes under the purview of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. And uh, within this ministry, um, lately since uh, 2016 when President Joko Widodo came to power that um, he wanted to promote um, a moderate form of uh, religiosity, what we call moderasi beragama. Uh, we don't quite know yet how to translate this, uh, this term, but some have used moderate religiosity, some have use religious moderation. But obviously, um, some people might have some reservations regarding the term moderation, because when it comes to religion and spirituality, there's always that passion and enthusiasm and the spirit that uh, oftentimes um, overcome uh, you know, an individual or group. Yeah? Um, but if you look at the current state of the Ministry of Religious Affairs, you can see well-educated and well-meaning civil servants uh, who are working tirelessly to monitor uh, the various religious groups, um, including some of the more recent, uh, you know, sort of new religious movements. Yeah, uh, we have had a lot of uh, recent NRMs, what we call NRMs, uh, New Religious Movements, popping up uh, in various uh, regions of Indonesia. Now, uh, my institution, ICRS, has been working with the ministry uh, since um, 2013, and we have a memorandum of understanding to work on various um, uh, issues. Uh, namely on uh, managing religious diversity and um, on, um, you know, uh, joint conferences um, and uh, publications and talks and uh, training and so on and so forth. But the latest program, the big program that we had was a program called Religious Literacy, uh, which we uh, intended to sort of train and enhance the awareness of the religious extension offices. You know, within uh, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, uh, they have what's called religious extension offices or religious counselors, which are spread across the country. And they number around 115,000. So you can just imagine the extent of their arm. And so this religious literacy was essentially to promote tolerance uh, social justice and multiculturalism. Uh, and so we have a module on religious literacy for the religious extension officers, as well as for the trainers. And so we had over the course of three years, um, trained 
uh, almost close to 1,000 religious extension officers, researchers, and uh, trainers. These are just some of the uh, activities and the product uh, in which the religious literacy had uh, produced during the course of the time. Um, now, Indonesia has been known for uh, many decades, if not at least a century, for the sort of the smiley form of Islam, yeah? Um, and we are known to have a different kind of Islam from that of the Middle East, so to speak. But then this image uh, of the smiley Islam has recently been sort of um, undermined by the various uh, exploits of some of the uh, extremist Muslims and radicalists and terrorists. Just within this month, we have had two suicide attacks, one on the Catholic Church on the cathedral in South Sulawesi, and one uh, which was a suicidal attack by um, a woman uh, with air soft gun uh, who attacked the um, headquarters of the national police in the capital city of Jakarta. And of course, there have been some, um, you know, uh, uh, support from some of the Muslim groups in Indonesia uh, toward um, extremist um, groups outside of Indonesia, such as uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and others. But the uh, idea about Indonesian Islam is this debate about whether the Islam uh, that we have here is Islam in Indonesia or of Indonesia. Yeah? So whether to say that the Islam in Indonesia is, is just uh, sort of a transportation or importation of Islam from the Middle East in Indonesia, or does the Indonesian culture have um, a say or is influencing um, uh, the religion? Of course, there has been lately um, a great influence of uh, some transnational uh, movements coming in from outside of Indonesia to influence the discourse and the practice of uh, Islam in Indonesia. But essentially, when we talk about Indonesian Islam, it's really about the fusion uh, of religion and, and, and culture. So Islam and the Indonesian um, cultural dimensions. Uh, and this um, sort of is uh, sort of embedded in this whole um, uh, discourse on the indigenization of Islam versus the Arabization of Islam. And so there is this uh, tug of war between those who like to still maintain the uh, sort of cultural ties with uh, um, Indonesia and those who are more sort of uh, affiliated to the uh, Middle Eastern form of uh, Islam, or more specifically, the Arabicized form of Islam. But um, for the past uh, 20 years or so, there has been this sort of um, uh, debate as well and deliberation about the compatibility of Islam and democracy. I remember attending the first uh, Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University, where I um, talked about the idea between, the you know, the compatibility between Islam and democracy. And one could argue that, um, that there are many principles within um, Islam that could be compatible with, uh, with the you know, democratic uh, practice. These are just some of the uh, major Islamic groups. We have the Muhammadiyah, uh, which was established in 1912, uh, which is a sort of a modernist organization. It has a wide network of schools from early childhood, kindergarten, primary, secondary, high school, and including universities across the um, country. The Nahdlatul Ulama is a more traditional um, organization established in 1926, um, which has produced a lot of ulama clerics uh, who are well versed in the classical sciences of Islam and have, um, you know, around maybe 20,000 or so Islamic traditional boarding schools across um, Indonesia. The latest one is the Majlis Ulama Indonesia or the Indonesian Council of Ulama, which have been quite problematic in recent uh, years because uh, they have been one of the uh, 
groups that have been considered as a contributor to this conservative turn in uh, Indonesia. In 2005, they issued a fatwa to uh, make um, pluralism, liberalism, and secularism as impermissible uh, uh, for Muslims. And I can talk to you and elaborate more on that if, uh, if you're interested in the question and answer. But my um, main message here is that um, as academics and intellectuals uh, positioned in higher education, uh, we need to think how we could sort of uh, promote religious diversity and how to um, have uh, that as sort of um, a common denominator um, for um, our society. Um, and I think uh, knowledge brokering is one um, sort of thing which we could uh, consider as a strategy. Because uh, the way I see it, based on my own sort of observation and um, uh, analysis, is that oftentimes that when you talk about religion, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Yeah? So non-religious people don't understand religion and religious people don't understand the secular people. And then the religious communities can't really understand uh, uh, the politicians or the bureaucrats in government and vice versa and so on and so forth. So I think uh, we as intellectuals and academics uh, in higher education, I think have a role to play in terms of uh, mediating uh, some of these uh, discussions and deliberations that are oftentimes, um, you know, um, causing a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, so the idea of knowledge brokering is also linking sort of scientific, academic work and strategic knowledge. Yeah, oftentimes, um, we are too um, fixated and embroiled in our own thinking about theories and, you know, scientific research without uh, necessarily sort of thinking strategically how some of these ideas could be implemented on the ground. So I think we need to also be involved and uh, try as much as possible to promote uh, knowledge exchanges, uh, because I think in, uh, in knowledge exchanges, uh, we can oftentimes play around with uh, new discursive tools, yeah? like the way uh, we had infuse, for instance, the idea of religious literacy within the Minister of Religious Affairs. You know, I mean, uh, for many people in Indonesia, that is obviously um, counterintuitive because you would think that religious people don't need religious literacy anymore, you know? Um, but then um, obviously I could prove them wrong and I can elaborate more on that. The other thing that uh, based on our experience is that we have played a role uh, to develop the capacity of, of research for the uh, civil servants, for uh, many of the bureaucrats so that they can develop their own set of thinking and analysis about how to engage religious communities um, in a very uh, fruitful manner. And also the building of linkages and networks between and among the civil society organizations, the religious communities and faith leaders, together with uh, you know, the government people, the policy makers, the bureaucrats and so on. And so the idea of co-designing evidence-based policies, I think uh, play a role here. You know, we, we can play um, a, a definite role here uh, and a fruitful one as well. In terms of, uh, and this is my last um, slide, ethical implications. In many countries, when it comes to religious diversity of any kind or diversity of any kind, you tend to find that there is this logic of majoritarianism, which behind that is really uh, hiding the politics of domination. And I think uh, all human beings are by nature in their fitra, in, in the Islamic uh, lingo, in their fitra is against any form of uh, domination. So I think when we uh, uh, you know, engage on issues of diversity, we need to be fully aware of where we stand, I think when it comes to the politics of domination, because oftentimes the logic of majoritarianism uh, is at play. Yeah? And oftentimes groups are labeled as minorities, uh, uh, while in fact uh, that labeling uh, has a lot of negative implications. I often um, 
argue, uh, including in my um, articles, that oftentimes this majority minority um, bifurcation uh, is not at all uh, meaningful or useful. And then this idea that uh, we need to fight for social justice and, and we need to uh, apply this to all uh, the groups uh, in society without any uh, discrimination, without any uh, sort of preference for our own sort of um, faith communities. And in doing so, as an academic, um, I like to promote action research because action research, I think, has greater implications um, for society. Uh, because it really, um, it's hard on, on, on how uh, we can resolve some of these issues. But uh, with action research, we need to be more open and adaptable to the various uh, systems of knowledge uh, that are out there. Oftentimes, we in academia tend to sort of um, take scientific research or scientific uh, uh, knowledge and theories as being uh, the most important uh, system of knowledge, while in fact, uh, in other contexts, uh, you know, other systems of knowledge are equally quite um, important. Avoiding the Trojan horse effect. In many of the discussions about uh, democracy and, and civil society, there's been a lot of talk about how civil society in many, um, especially developing countries, have become Trojan horses. Yeah. They have come in to bring in uh, outside foreign ideas to the country to essentially um, sort of destabilize and weaken uh, the state and society. So I think um, for us and for those who are dealing with um, uh, ethnic and religious uh, diversity, that we need to be fully aware of, of this game and not to be sort of, um, you know, uh, be uh, in any way affected by this uh, strategy from um, the external forces. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation and thank you for your kind uh, attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sofian. Uh, this was um, a highly fascinating and instructive uh, contribution. You have taken us um, through uh, the uh, Indonesian um, uh, realities in terms of uh, the religious um, uh, demography, first of all, uh, and you have accentuated um, how there is, um, in fact, um, uh, a bland and, and constant overlap between religion, um, societal factors and culture, um, and how important it is not only for uh, the governmental authorities, but in fact of um, every societal um, actors to um, be engaged, actively engaged in what you have called diversity uh, management. And you have brought to the fore this idea of knowledge brokering, which uh, certainly is um, a very interesting um, um, idea to build upon the common denominators um, of all religions and how um, especially um, academics um, and uh, researchers can play a positive role, a mediating role in societies uh, to build uh, those um, constructive exchanges of knowledge and you have given your own um, uh, example or the example coming from your institution um, and the collaboration with other um, actors of the religious literacy uh, program and uh, you ended with the ethical implications of such a methodology and such an engagement. So thank you once again for um, your, your highly interesting contribution. We are now opening uh, the question uh, and answer um, section and um, I see that we have many uh, questions. I hand over to my colleague Lydia to moderate that part. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you so much, Professor, for this presentation. It was very interesting and informative. Uh, I would like to ask our audience to post uh, their questions in the chat and question and answers feature. And in the meantime, I suggest to, to start with the question that we already received. Uh, so the first question we have from John Kennedy. 
And it's um, the question is before 2016, what was the condition of Indonesia and how it came to transcend from one stand to another? Is it due to modernization when Europeans spread all over the world? Uh, industrialization. Thank you very much, John, for the um, question. Well, um, the Indonesian reform um, took place in 97, 98, and it was 1998 that the new order regime, the autocratic regime of Suharto had been uh, dethroned. And obviously before that, uh, or during the time of Suharto, you found a lot of uh, restriction, religious restrictions uh, on all of the um, religions, really, including Islam, uh, because they, they had a sort of um, a way of looking at society and uh, they had this simplistic idea about um, how to mitigate the extreme left as being the communists and the extreme right as being the fundamentalists. And so uh, after reform, that kind of bifurcation had uh, sort of uh, been undermined. Uh, yeah, and, and so um, and there was this explosion of participation, this explosion of uh, uh, you know, the establishment of political parties, including uh, religious political parties. But then with that, um, I think with the explosion of participation and democratization and liberalization that you also found a lot of um, uh, underground uh, groups starting to, um, you know, go on the surface and become more active in their um, resistance against the, uh, you know, sort of the state, so to speak, because some of these uh, groups have different uh, competing visions of the state. They don't necessarily see Pancasila as a state ideology as being the ideal one. Some of these groups um, want uh, to establish an Islamic state, while some uh, have a much more extreme view of um, sort of um, getting Indonesia being part of the uh, caliphate, which was um, trying to be established by ISIS, ISIL, Al Qaeda, or Hezbo Tahrir, and others, or even to establish a super state by uh, a regional uh, terror group by the name of Jama Islamiyah. And so, right after reform, there was a lot of uh, these um, upheavals uh, and uh, aspirations that were initially um, sort of uh, put down by the Suharto regime. But right after reform, then there was a lot of um, uh, commotion about and, and the rise of religious uh, identity politics uh, going on. And so uh, before the tenure of Joko Widodo, we also saw a lot of facilitation by the state uh, on, on conservative uh, groups to air their views and aspiration. I mentioned about the, uh, the issuance of the fatwa against uh, secularism, against pluralism and liberalism. And obviously that was met by the more liberal and more progressive religious groups, including Muslim groups, um, to sort of um, undermine that. In fact, some of the um, uh, leaders from the progressive groups would say, you know, one of the beauties of the fatwas coming from the Indonesian Council Ulama is that you can simply just ignore them. Yeah because you know, we consider, or at least most of the uh, liberal and progressive Muslims consider the Indonesian Council of Ulamas as being simply another NGO as opposed to a, uh, a strictly um, religious authority that monopolizes uh, fatwas and religious um, thinking. Thank you so much. We have received another question from John. Um, historically speaking, Indonesia has faced so many natural calamities like earthquakes, floods, flood, tsunami, etc. Yet it's not yet destroyed. Do you hold the opinion that it's because of God's hands are always on them because of their tolerance with other religious practices? Yeah, uh, I, I don't quite know how to uh, answer this because this is a very difficult question. But you know, we, we believe in this mantra in Islam, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, yeah? that uh, 
everything uh, originates from him and shall return to him. So, and this is the same kind of mantra in which we say each time we face a calamity. Obviously, the biggest calamity that we've had was the um, 26th of uh, December uh, 2004 tsunami in Aceh, which uh, I think was considered as a sort of a tsunami that was um, uh, in, in biblical proportions, yeah, which killed uh, more than uh, 200,000 people. And I think uh, at least 100,000 uh, people uh, perished uh, in uh, Indonesia, especially in Aceh and northern Sumatra and so on. But you know, uh, despite all of these calamities, uh, that we are a resilient society. Um, and we have been for so many uh, years and centuries. I mean, uh, Indonesians are considered as old people in, in Southeast Asia. I'm sure you've heard of the, uh, you know, the uh, ancient, um, ancient people uh, on the islands of Java and Florence and, and so on. Yeah? So we do have prehistoric um, background uh, here in this part of the world. And, and so I think many of us uh, believe that calamities are all part and parcel of reality, of living in uh, this ring of fire uh, within the Asia Pacific region. Uh, thank you very much. We have a few more questions, um, but we need to keep in mind the time. So um, maybe we could answer, you could answer a few more questions now, and then we have a second part of our question and answer sessions, and then we can answer the rest. And also some of the questions we received in question and answer feature below, uh, there you can um, respond to, to, to the questions in written. So let's um, now let's see the last question. Uh, for example, do you have any concrete plan for social justice? Yes. Uh, well, this is a very good um, question because in our state ideology, uh, the, the five main principles of Panchasila, actually the fifth and last principle is uh, social justice for all Indonesians. And one of the things I think has been missing all along is that we have yet to determine exactly how to define social justice. Yeah. Um, some have said that you know the administration of social justice is much more important than how we define social justice but i think both are equally important and i think one of the um things i mentioned about religious literacy is that uh that program was specifically uh to promote tolerance social justice and multiculturalism and that is essentially to apply uh, what we see as the ideal uh, form of social justice. You see, uh, my own understanding of social justice is that you see people with the same uh, dignity uh, as all others, including yourself, right? So you have this uh, principle that everyone is equal before the law and that everyone has a right to contribute to the development of the state and society and that they should all be uh, treated equally without discrimination. To me, that is social justice, yeah? Uh, but the problem is if you have traditional cleavages, if you have religious and ethnic uh, uh, differences, um, and these differences cause friction and conflict, this is where you try to sort of mitigate the problem by way of education or raising their awareness or um, to give some of these people some training um, to, uh, for them to be able to uh, be familiar and comfortable with differences. And I think that was one of the objectives of the religious literacy program. And that is for people not to study religion, but to study about religion, not to learn religion, but to learn about religion, about the, uh, the, you know, the diversity within religions. Yeah. Um, and so that is the uh, main thrust of the religious literacy program. Uh, and so once you have that realization, 
of the uh, multitude of interpretations of religion, both in your own uh, faith traditions and others, then one tends to develop, develop a more sort of moderate view of, um, of religion. And that is our expectation, that people then can relate and appreciate more of uh, the religious others. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would suggest that we move on because we have a second part uh, and we have received all your questions and we will answer them uh, just, yes, maybe a bit later. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to hand over to our second speaker. Um, our second speaker uh, and uh, it's Angelique Worker smith Senior Associate for Pan-African and Orthodox Church Engagement at Bread for the World in Washington, D.C. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being with us. Um, it's over to you. Uh, thank you so much. I want to say hello to everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you to uh, particularly Dr. Amelia Kuhn, who I've worked with in previous uh, iterations before she came to Global Ethics with World Council of Churches. And thank you uh, for the opportunity to share. Um, my uh, perspective is around uh, what is now being called diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, what is being called the DEI in the US context. Uh, as you may uh, know, um, many of the points that my colleague has already mentioned around diversity and demographics. Uh, these, these kinds of multi-expressions of religious life, social and cultural life exists in the U.S. Um, I didn't prepare a presentation to so much to bring the demographics as much as to wrestle with some of the ethical issues around the emerging paradigm within the U.S. of how we discuss diversity in the U.S. I am happy to answer more questions around the demographics and other details at a later point, but given the limited amount of time, I really wanted to dive right into the trends uh, that are happening in the U.S. context. And so uh, I hope this will still be of interest to everyone. Let me begin with my overview. Um, this overview uh, is an opportunity to uh, say that this presentation uh, is intended to query the divergent and complementary trends of ethical assumptions that are defining a more equitable, inclusive, and diverse community in the U.S. context. And this term DEI is how it's being currently captured. I'll say more about the definition of this in a moment. So the context, uh, U.S. institutions and movements within and outside of faith uh, perspectives or faith fears are wrestling with the frameworks for achieving this in a public space, but historic inequities persist. So I'm beginning with this conversation around how it is we work within these kind of contradictory frameworks of approaching uh, a kind of positive DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion uh, objective. Uh, here again, uh, we're going to dig more deeply into some of the historic challenges that prevent or even hinder uh, the possibilities of what the vision is. So what is the real question here? The question is, is how can historic colonial institutions morally lead without careful scrutiny concerning the root causes of racism, gender bias, and economic disparities that inform these challenges today? Again, this is the fundamental ethical question I think is being asked as we look at this emerging paradigm of what is being called DEI in the United States. People like uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, I'm going to scroll up a little bit here, who I would encourage you to, to read uh, a bit later if you have not, uh, in his book, Strength to Love, uh, provides a kind of primary resource, I think, in having this kind of discussion, uh, where he talks about this vision of the beloved community. Uh, Dr. Howard Thurman uh, is another one that I bring to mind uh, in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited. Um, uh, Dr. Thurman, Howard Thurman was a mystic and a theologian and one who actually taught Dr. Martin Luther King. And so in these two gentlemen, you see this kind of intersection of the importance of the, the ethic of love 
and the ethic of uh, respect and tolerance, some of the things that my colleague mentioned, uh, but from a biblical theological perspective. I'll say more about that in a moment. But these are resources I invite you to invite, investigate later. And then also one of the movements that Dr. Cleary and I have been involved with, they were co-editors of a volume for the World Council of Churches, um, is around Pan-African Women's Ecumenical Empowerment. Uh, in this particular iteration, um, this uh, resource, you'll find different perspectives, particularly from women of African descent, who are speaking into some of these issues from their various locations in society. Yesterday, which some of us will know, um, we had a case study that um, deals with some of these issues. Uh, we finally had some resolve of what is called the, the Derek Chauvin um, case, the trial of um, Derek Chauvin relative to the death of George Floyd. This particular example of what everyone is really living with in the US in this moment, it just happens to be that we are here the day after the verdict on this case. Uh, the three verdicts, I might add, in this case, that I think kind of shine light into some of these issues around where is there an ethic of love, where there's an ethic of really dealing with historical justices um, in this moment, and really calls into question how far the experiment on diversity can really work. And, and how does DEI, these principles of DEI, uh, get lifted up in this case study? Let me go right on to my next point here. Um, so let me further define what DEI is in the US context. Diversity, equity, inclusion is a term that is used to describe programs and policies that encourage representation and participation of diverse groups of peoples, including people of different genders, races and ethnicities, abilities and disabilities, religions, cultures, ages, and sexual orientations, and people with diverse backgrounds, experiences, and skills, and expertise. It is an expansion of the term diversity and inclusion to reflect the growing focus on equity in organizations. DEI is not just a, quote, feel-good initiative. It is meant uh, by uh, virtue of research that diverse viewpoints at all levels of an organization improves well, financial results, organizational, team performance, innovation, and other areas of organization, business, or collectives. So the premise here is to actually change what has been assumptions in the past that the predominant white narrative, uh, which many have called white supremacy in the U.S. context, has to shift to the assets of what diversity brings in all of its presentations to strengthen as opposed to weaken uh, a system of, uh, of homogeneity, but rather to say that the diversities actually bring strength to the opportunity to be together, as Dr. Plume would call, the beloved community. This is a major shift uh, from the ways in which many of us have uh, been taught and grown up in, in the United, uh, raised in the United States, um, and is really being tested uh, as the demographics are changing in the United States uh, to a quote, quote, majority minority country. Uh, we see the increase that is happening. It is predicted in the demographics that by 2040 or even 2050, somewhere in there, that the U.S. will be primarily made up of people of the quote, minority uh, as the majority in the United States. So we're at a crucible moment in the United States. So what does that mean going forward? This idea of DEI, I think is, is rooted in scripture. Uh, finally, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. First Peter 3, 8, I think is an example of a biblical text that actually is to some extent uh, for me who is working from a theological perspective, helps to undergird this DEI approach. That being said, uh, there are major tests. <laughs> um, you know, going back to the, 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 the prior narrative of a more homogeneous narrative to try to move to a more heterogeneous uh, uh, narrative of diversity. Dr. Martin Luther King envisioned a beloved community that has found successive favor 
in what I would call the Black, in what has been called the Black Lives Matter season for DEI principles in the U.S. in global context. That includes communities historically marginalized from the benefits of the U.S., the majority of white, that white communities enjoy in the United States. One of the key issues in all of this, as we look at this kind of DEI approach, however, is the historic wealth gap and other lack of benefits that we can name, which we don't have time to name, that exists before in this primarily white narrative in the United States. And so DEI is really tested uh, in some ways that it hasn't, that um, have not really been tested before because now there is more of an opening for this kind of discussion. DEI is a secular approximation of what Dr. King was talking about in terms of his beloved community. Um, but it doesn't have a recognition. This secular approach doesn't really have the full recognition of a biblical and ethical foundation of love, equity, compassion, humility, empathy, and other spiritual gifts that people like Dr. King are espousing. DEI also doesn't have this kind of recognition of the ways, public recognition of how faith can help inform this more secularized approach that we're trying to track. And therefore, DEI, where I think it is a helpful approach to thinking about how we engage with one another, does not really look at the basis that can really help to further define it. And so DEI, in my uh, estimation really has a limited scope because it doesn't have the kind of recognition of the kind of substantive foundations that are contrary to the white narrative of being more, um, more parochial in its approach. Uh, people like Dr. Berman offer a helpful and complementary corrective to this kind of challenge that DEI um, does not fully recognize. That is, these kind of substantive spiritual foundations that I think inform the possibility of DEI having the excess, um, success. His treaties on the disinherited, referred to in earlier points that I've made around the historical challenges, uh, is very important to how it is we address this DEI approach. In other words, um, that there needs to be a higher value placed on personal transformation for overcoming some of the structural challenges that are before us. Um, in the George Floyd case, for example, what is really revealing about that case is that it was actually a one-on-one -on -one that brought down the, that brought up, if you will, the opportunity for structural conversation to be discussed. Uh, it was his lack of heart. <laughs> it was his lack of embracing some of these kinds of spiritual concepts that are key to a more structural approach that actually brought us to literally the needs of the U.S. context. Uh, in the end, it was this one-on-one -on -one con con uh, context between Mr. Chauvin and Mr. Floyd, where there was this pleading of, I mean, it's as if this case was a metaphor of how it is the tensions between this lack of personal transformation did not lead to, a, it has led to a social transformation, but in that moment actually led to the demise of what it is that um, could have happened if there was personal transformation in that moment. Dr. Thurman really helps us to understand how it is that personal transformation can lead to social transformation. And so it is very important for the faith community to understand that the work that we do, whatever our religious perspectives are, is to very much have attention to personal individualistic approaches and values, because that is actually the basis in which social transformation can take place. And Dr. Thurman helps us to understand that from his mystical perspective. I think another key ingredient to the possible success of DEI, which needs more attention, is that there needs to be more room for rewriting the conventional narratives. Heretofore, we've had a predominantly white narrative uh, that has informed and has really dominated the ways in which we approach uh, our thinking relative to engagement in public society and even on one-on-one -on -one relationships. 
uh, the, the frame of references are predominantly white metaphors and histories. Um, I remember when I took world history, for example, when I was in high school, and I basically learned European history. I mean, that's primarily what, what the narrative was. World history was actually Europe, as opposed to various perspectives from around the world. There was minimal attention to other histories and narratives and stories in the global context in a world history class that really helped to understand, help others, help the student to understand this kind of globalized context of multi-narratives, the meta-narratives within the world. I, I think the ecumenical review that Dr. Thuy and I uh, contribute to helps us to understand uh, uh, different perspectives on this of how it is we write the narrative. Now it's from a perspective of women of African descent and of Africa in terms of how we're seeking to rewrite this narrative. But I think this point of rewriting the narrative is going to be key for any kind of larger societal engagement of DEI. There has to be room for that. And that's throughout all the sectors of the society. Um, and, and that approach needs to be approached with a, with a, uh, a, a sense of humility, of being able to listen. Yesterday, I'm in the middle of a major conference this week uh, on cli uh, climate justice. And yesterday I had the great opportunity to moderate a panel um, about global and domestic perspectives on climate justice. And one of the speakers was from Bolivia, another one was from the indigenous community within the United States. Uh, and then another speaker that was there that was speaking um, out of their context uh, of actually, uh, as it turns out, the Pacific Islands. And what was so revealing, and it was all in the chat, was, wow. Like, I mean, people didn't even know like some of these communities even existed. And there were dominant communities in those national contexts, not least of which is the United States. In the United States, just like we have in places like in uh, Indonesia, we have uh, nations within the United States. We have indigenous nations and groups within the United States. But oftentimes when we refer to the United States, we say the United States of America, but we don't mention the particularities, the Virgin Islands, the territories, the, the nations within that were here long before the exportation of European culture and other cultures that have arised since then. So rewriting the narrative, understanding each other's stories, and having that mainstreamed into educational, as uh, my colleague was saying, into knowledge uh, places matters. And so DEI um, has to find a way to fully embrace those narratives. And I think that is biblical. So the ethical questions for the long haul remain. How will people of faith further address and lead the faith engagement of conversions of the heart and not just revision of only just laws and processes? How will the faith community deepen a resolve to dismantle the historic colonial structures and processes that lead to a substantive DEI vision? I believe and many believe that the U.S. is at a crossroads for answering these questions and that the faith community must lead uh, the path of personal conversion uh, with an ethic of love of God, neighbor, and self. Again, George Floyd's case study just, just demonst demonstrates what happens when an individual does not receive and give these gifts. At the same time, social transformation with an ethic of love that leads to repair communities has to consider approaches to reparatory justice and the redress of structural challenges like racial and gender wealth gap and the dismantling of structural systems that further racialize class inequities, which is a key ethical response for doing this. In other words, reforms are not enough. Conversion. Conversion happens when we deal with the historicity that moves into a new light of possibility, both personally and also for social transformation that can benefit all. This is a very difficult moment in the U.S. as we have this kind of reckoning of what has been the history of white domination and as the reality that has always been there 
of diversity within this U.S. context has been marginalized and now being brought to the center. That's part of what the Black Lives Matter movement is really all about. The Black Lives Matter movement was not just people of African descent, although we were my, my, uh, primarily in the leadership of it, but it really was a coalition like the civil rights movement was in the 60s. It was a broad-based coalition and it has actually been globalized um, in this moment. Um, and that kind of young people, global coalitions coming together in this moment, demanding change really matters. And it is a movement that is seeking to look at these historic challenges to lead us into the future. It is in these kind of coming together of these movements where personal relationships are being new, uh, created uh, and being renewed. And the faith community has a role to play in terms of the soul of these movements. There have been people of faith out there as well. But I think more and more of this coming together from the faith community with the movements that are taking place in the US and also globally is where we can actually see transformation and not just reforms. And so my hope is that as we move into the future, there will be more of a kind of coming together of conversation for personal transformation that can lead to social transformation. But this pivotal moment offers that opportunity for us to do so. Just a last footnote about the George Floyd case, because we're just living in that moment here in the US in a very important way. Uh, President Obama has actually spoken into this moment about uh, what yet needs to be done. It is good, for example, the milestone that came yesterday relative to the three verdicts of being guilty of the person who did the unthinkable with Mr. Floyd. But this is just a renewed beginning for people in the United States. Going forward, the structural, historic structural injustices still need to be contended with. And the faith community has a major role to play in leading this vision of a beloved community. So hopefully this is helpful to thinking about some of the issues of diversity that we're really wrestling with in the U.S. in this context. Uh, the George Floyd case just happens as we're moving toward, again, this demographic shift that is, quote, an eventuality. How we get there has a lot to do with how the faith community leads. Thank you very much, um, Angelique. Uh, you have offered us um, a presentation that is uh, indeed uh, very deep, um, critical, uh, thought-provoking, and in many ways uh, comes from a contextual experience but speaks uh, into so many realities of our days in so many uh, regions. And I find it also resonating with um, the topics um, and aspects that we have uh, heard from uh, Diki Sofian uh, earlier on. You come from uh, your own uh, experience and expertise as a theologian, uh, but also someone who is uh, deeply um, informed uh, by societal um, engagement and most of all by um, your own um, uh, life um, history and uh, commitment in um, uh, Christian uh, faith and you have made allusion to so many important uh, references um, that informs your theological uh, journey. You mentioned Martin Luther King and Howard Thurman and um, you have related this to um, very um, uh, contemporary incidences where we can verify what you have called the necessity to um, dismantle uh, colonial structures and narratives, uh, dominant narratives uh, that prevent us to uh, see what uh, you have underlined as the necessary shift um, from uh, this dominant um, uh, thinking um, to 
um, uh, a full um, uh, conversion that finally leads also to social um, uh, transformation. Uh, we have already extended our time and I would like to ask uh, both our speakers, but also of course our participants uh, for their uh, kind um, uh, patience and, and understanding uh, for, uh, for this extension. But uh, I think we feel all how um, yeah, interesting and um, uh, important um, it is uh, that uh, we not only listen to it, but offer now um, a short um, moment for another round of questions that may be uh, raised um, from the attendees. And I pass over again to my colleague, Lydia. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Angelique. Yes, we have received a few more questions and uh, Dickie, he responded uh, in written to some of your questions. So um, we have received a question for Angelique. Do we bring the idea of DEI to the society through education or by force by distributing some needs of the people? Thank you so much. I think it has to be both. <laughs> that there has to be social and personal demand made on the societal experiment. We do have a constitution that does allow for grievances to be heard. We do have that. That's the basis of this country. And so reforms are invited. But what I'm really arguing for is not just reforms, but transformation. And so transformation is partly uh, achieved when we engage the educated process as well as the social demands of public policy and practices that need to change. So I think it is a both on, that both end. It has to be educative and it also needs to be a societal prophetic engagement on the ground and in personal relationships. Thank you. We have another question from John Kennedy. Um, why do you limit yourself when there is more openings for your DEI through a lot of awareness programs to recognize, realize, and rectify with them? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. There was a check. Why do you limit yourself when there is more openings for your DEI through a lot of awareness programs to recognize, realize, and rectify with them? Yeah, I don't think I'm limiting myself. I mean, we've been here before, right? We're talking about over 400 years of this kind of structural challenge uh, in the United States. Uh, we've had the, the, the period of uh, the reconstruction period in the late 1800s. Uh, we had the civil rights movement. This is not a new moment. Uh, DEI uh, to me is another reiteration of previous moments where we've had openings and where the door has been opened, but unfortunately the door is closed. And a lot of it has to do with the administrations that are elected into, into uh, public office, the policies, and not only the policies, but personal practices where there hasn't been personal transformation. So I am one, when I look at history, uh, want to carefully scrutinize any quote new opening because past openings have been shut or have been reduced. As soon as there is a major opening, I mean, Reconstruction is a perfect example. I mean, that was 12 years of possibility where we had an opportunity to overcome the period of enslavement and allow for people of African descent, for example, to have more opportunities economically. That door was shut when the next uh, uh, leaders of the public policy were put into office. So I am not saying I want to limit uh, the, the possibilities of DI, I'm fully open to it, but I also understand that the historic injustices are more than what a lot of people want to confront until there is that kind of dismantling and living into a more post-colonial uh, narrative, a post-colonial possibility, we're still going to be repeating what we've known in the past, and I'm very concerned about that. Thank you so much, Angelique. Um, I would suggest that uh, if you have any other questions, you can send them to our email address. 
and we will contact our speakers. Uh, I'm sharing uh, our email address in the chat. So if you have any other questions, please send us an email and you will receive uh, the response. Thank you so much for everyone for attending our webinar. And I hand over to Emily for the final words. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia. Uh, mine is the role to uh, thank uh, all for their participation. Uh, of course, I'm indebted to uh, my dear uh, colleagues. It has been um, a genuine uh, pleasure, Reverend Dr. Angelique Walker-Smith. Uh, we um, have a long-standing um, collegiality and friendship that unites us, and it has been uh, a pleasure having you here as part of the webinar with um, such profound and inspiring um, ideas for our ongoing conversation. So this is not the end. Um, and also to Professor uh, Diki Sofian, uh, who has offered us um, such um, uh, a profound contribution from uh, his um, uh, perspective. We see that those uh, threads um, in this ethical conversation will continue to um, stay with us um, and so do we hope that you will um, uh, remain connected to us, uh, not the least for our next webinar which uh, will uh, take uh, place um, next uh, month uh, in uh, May, um, I hope I can uh, give you the um, date um, of 19th of May. It is the 18th of May. Uh, thank you, Lydia. Um, and uh, we will announce it, of course, on our platform and website. So do please um, uh, check our website for the announcements uh, and register and join us. Uh, we would love to stay connected. You have our email for any follow-up questions and our course participants will find uh, this webinar on our platform. Thank you very much to um, <clears throat> Um, our speakers and to our entire team and to uh, you, the participants from all countries of the world. It has been a pleasure having you. And until next time, thanking you for your uh, time and uh, even more uh, than uh, what we had planned. It was all worth it. Um, thank you and goodbye.